Hi, welcome to this Max Weber program interview. We're here today with Professor Rogers Brubaker, who's a professor of sociology at UCLA. Um, I'm Christine Hobden, a Max Weber, Max Weber fellow. Um, and we're delighted to have you here. Um, later this afternoon, Professor Brubaker will be giving a Max Weber lecture on the religious dimensions of political conflict and political violence. So we have an interdisciplinary program and I expect that not everybody who will end up watching this interview will be familiar with all parts of your work. So I was wondering if we could perhaps start by you giving us a brief outline of what you view as your main academic contributions and interests and perhaps a little bit about what motivates you to focus on these topics particularly. Well thanks, it's nice to be here. Uh, the career has become a somewhat longish one. So I have had the privilege of working on a number of topics, from some topics in social theory, particularly concerned with Weber and Bourdieu. Um, I worked on immigration and the politics of citizenship uh, in Western Europe and North America. I worked on nationalist politics in Soviet successor states and the states that emerged from the former Yugoslavia after the fall of communism. I then did more ethnographic field work in a Transylvanian town exploring of people's everyday understandings of ethnicity, and I've then, in my two most recent books, I explored key concepts in the social sciences, things like identity, diaspora, assimilation, violence, race, ethnicity, more recently, religion, sex, and gender. So what holds all this together? I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, one, one discovers uh, as one's career proceeds, one rewrites, in a sense, the, the narrative of, of that career. And in my most recent book, which, uh, uh, is actually on a completely new subject for me on, on uh, race and gender as, as increasingly unstable identities and so on. I came to kind of retrospectively uh, understand that I had been working on categories uh, for all of my career. That is on a set of categories, uh, categories of difference I would call them, um, that structure our social and political experience in the modern world fundamental categories, fundamental principles of vision and division of the social world, as Pierre Bourdieu would call them. And uh, all of the categories that I've been concerned with fall under this, this description, that is nation, citizenship, race, ethnicity, religion, gender, and sexuality. These are all basic principles of vision and division, basic categories that structure our experience of the social world. So I guess my own interest has been in the way categories work, um, in the politics of categories, the large-scale politics, the meso-level politics, even the micro-politics of categories. So I, I think that really ties together uh, the different strands of my work, and I, so I, and I think in all of that work I'm addressing some questions about how categories work, questions like who has access to what categories and to the, the social spaces, the rights and privileges, uh, the opportunities linked to membership in a category, uh, who controls uh, and who polices the boundaries of categories, how do the boundaries of categories change over time, how do new categories come into existence, that's particularly interesting to me in some of this most recent work. Uh, can one choose to become a member of a category that is ordinarily understood as being fixed and ascribed at birth? Uh, and lastly, in a world um, pervasively structured by categories, can one live beyond categories or between categories, or is one, as it were, uh, pinned down uh, by this dense classificatory grid. So I think that's a, um, a unifying theme that ties together these otherwise rather disparate inter interests. Great. So I think that's really um, appropriate given what the next the question I was thinking of asking. So you've spoken about how um, kind of the idea of categories has been what's drawn together a lot of your really fascinating and, and diverse research. Um, and perhaps I can ask something about how maybe your idea of how categories work has evolved o over time. So I think in your older work, particularly um, on your very prominent book on citizenship and nationhood in, in France and Germany, it's often viewed to have quite an essentialist ontology. Um, and your work later evolved into adopting more constructivist stances, arguing that constructs such as nations or ethnic groups and diasporas should not be seen as essentialist analytic categories categories, but as categories of practice or discursive structures that we should analyze without essentializing. So could you tell us perhaps a bit about 
the background of this evolution in your thinking and in your work and what compelled you to change position over time and perhaps how you view that work now in light of your, your current progress. Great. No, good question. I, would, I want to slightly, uh, very slightly resist the terms of the question in that I wouldn't um, uh, characterize my uh, analyses, say, of traditions of nationhood in France and Germany as essentialist, uh, but I would agree that it was, what I would say is that it was over-historicized. Um, in that I did, even in that work, emphasize uh, that these French and German ways of thinking and talking about nationhood were contested, uh, that prevailing idioms were challenged by counter idioms and so on, but I didn't clearly give enough attention, enough emphasis to the uh, how deeply and chronically um, contested and multivocal uh, uh, such stories of people, such traditions of nationhood were. And I think in that work, I definitely gave too much um, weight to certain moments, certain historical moments where I argued that certain ways of thinking became crystallized and so on. And I think that's the wrong kind of, wrong kind of imagery. I, uh, and, and in terms of what kind of prompted the, the shift, I would, I, I would point to two uh, things. One, uh, my experience reading Bourdieu uh, over the years, who is uh, never tired of uh, criticizing substantialist uh, ways of thinking and never tired of urging us rather to think in terms of relations and processes and so on, which are chronically contested and so on. So that theoretical tradition, uh, but also then my own experience doing field work, which uh, was new to me when I ended up spending uh, many years working on a long-term uh, project in a Transylvanian town. And when you see things up close, then of course, big constructs like traditions of nationhood tend to dissolve fragment, uh, seem less substantial, and so on. And I think ethnography is great training. Maybe it should be obligatory for anyone thinking of doing macro level work, because you know, when, you, when you work on a lower level of analysis, you, I do think you a uh, more experienced near uh, uh, level of analysis. I think you do come away with um, a kind of generalized skepticism towards the reality of any kind of large, big concepts, and so on, and to, towards their substantiality. And you're always thinking, well, what's behind? It's not that we shouldn't use a category like the state or nation and so on, but what's behind those categories? When we, and what, you know, if we can rethink them uh, in, in ways that are sensitive to their, uh, I would say, pervasive insubstantiality and it, it being attuned to what, what is behind a, a big and seemingly solid concept like state or nation or citizenship, something like that. So it's both you know, my own research trajectory and uh, the, the great influence of Bourdieu, and I would say Weber as well. I mean, Weber, um, uh, uh, Weber's pages, for example, on ethnicity and nationality are not terribly well known, but they are hyper-constructivist, actually, constructivist avant la lettre. Right? If you go back and look at those pages, um, he's extremely skeptical of uh, the concept of an ethnic group as a substantial thing, or the concept of nation. We're talking about nation, for example, Weber emphasizes that it's a category that does work in practice. You know, so it's a kind of anticipating Bourdieu's uh, point, I would say, that the, the category nation for Weber is something that does something. It, it, it demands loyalty and so on. It says that it's, certain, it's proper to expect certain things of people when we use that category. But is it, a, is it a useful category of analysis? Not for Weber. So Weber, as well as Bourdieu, I think, is behind that, um, uh, what you described as this uh, constructivist stance. Great. So, I mean, I think that's a really helpful answer, I think, especially for those of us more early on in, in our career, this idea of building depth to your thoughts and thinking through both kind of attention and going back to theoretical ideas. Um, and it was really interesting to hear that the field work itself was, was really formative in, in changing your thinking. Um, as a, a political philosopher, that's something maybe I'll have to give mm -hmm. some thought to, you know, going into, into the field and really speaking to people and seeing their experiences. Um, I think it's really fascinating how that can really change your thinking in, in meaningful ways. So perhaps moving on, we can talk a bit about um, some of the topics you'll be speaking to us this, this week at the EUI, in both the Masterclass and, and the Max Weber Lecture we'll be having. So I was interested in the way you argue that different kinds of difference, such as citizenship or language or religion, create inequality in different ways. Um, and that made me wonder how you think this might inform the ways in which we go about trying to combat inequality in society. 
And perhaps if you think it does prompt us to have different approaches to combating different kinds of, of inequality, whether you thought perhaps at times these might be competing. Because I think one reason why we might favour kind of more comprehensive, larger scale views on these issues is they help us to justify prioritising some aims over others. Um, and whether you thought there might be something um, kind of in your approach that will help us in, in combating inequality specifically. Uh, well, yes, I'm not. I'm your political theorist, and I'm I'm not. Um, but I do think that and it's an argument that um, you know, I've had with uh, Will Kim, like among others, for a long time. That uh, political theorists and sociologists and other empirically oriented social scientists ought to have kind of closer uh, their work ought to be in closer dialogue. I mean, even if you know I've never done the kind of work that's directly policy relevant, and I don't think of myself as as doing such work or as doing normative social analysis. I certainly agree with you that for normative political theory, uh, of course it's useful, as you suggest, to have a, um, a, sta a more general standpoint so that you can prioritize among different, you know, so it, it would, it's entirely appropriate for a political theorist to uh, uh, try to think about, well, what are the fundamental goods at stake, the fundamental um, uh, uh, desiderata, the fundamental opportunities, the fundamental rights, and so on, which would, of course, cut across then various domains of, of, of difference. So I, I completely agree with that. And I also would argue that even for um, social scientists, it's also useful to take a broader and more general view. Uh, there's, I think, always a tension, though, between such broader views, um, uh, which, because they're broader, because they're more general, are necessarily more abstract, and necessarily then, in a certain sense, flattening. Um, so, for example, with respect to the language, uh, 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 the, the politics of language and the politics of uh, religious difference, um, many social scientists uh, have folded them together under a broader rubric, like the politics, say, of ethnicity, because, of course, uh, language and religion are both components of, what, uh, of, of ethnic identities in, in, in practice. And that's, very, that's a very useful move. And yet, at the same time, I want to argue that it's also useful to uh, stress the dynamics of, of different uh, differences. Um, now, one uh, point that you brought up, though, is that uh, sometimes, uh, in terms of you know, how you might combat inequalities, there may be some tensions uh, uh, between different des desirable goods. And of course, that's, that's often the case. I don't think it comes out so much in the language and uh, um, language and religious domains. That is, I don't think if you're trying to uh, um, minimize uh, some of the inequalities caused by language pluralism, uh, or, or, or I don't think that's intention with trying to accommodate broadly forms of religious difference. However, there obviously are cases uh, where accommodating one kind of difference is intention with accommodating another kind, or where pursuing one kind of um, inequality is in tension with pursuing another kind of equality, and religion's clearly involved in those, right? So the kinds of, um, you know, the classic form of this is what should a stance be uh, towards uh, uh, religious communities which are themselves non-liberal, or maybe even illiberal, uh, which, let's say, if we specifically want to consider promoting two domains of rights or two domains of goods, think of gender and sexuality on the one hand, religion on the other hand, okay, these are two desiderata, it may be desirable in the abstract to accommodate religious difference and so on, just as it may be desirable to recognize forms of gender and sexual difference and promote a politics of gender and sexual e equality. But if equality in accommodating religious difference leads you then to uh, sanction, permit, tolerate, encourage, celebrate forms of religious difference that themselves maybe do not support gender and sexual equality, then of course there's a tension. So um, I think that, that there are competing um, that, 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 that not all good things can be realized simultaneously is a lesson political theorists have taught us for a long time, I, th I think, that, and I think it's in, in entirely true. I don't think you see it so much in the language versus religion, but I do think it's, I think, I think it's certainly the case, which means that there can't be, which, but to me, that's an argument for, again, taking seriously the more uh, um, explorations of different differences, right? You can't just have a politics driven by some abstract notion of inclusion because it works very differently in different domains and include one kind of exclusion, inclusion, may lead to exclusion in some other domain. So to me, that's an argument for always moving down a level of generality for 
and even as a normative political theorist. And I think that's what, say, somebody like Reiner Baubach does and makes his work so effective. He both works at a, you know, he, 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 he's a, a generalizing theorist, but he also then moves down, knows a lot about particular domains, including, I should say, language and religion. And there's that constant movement back and forth between the more, uh, the specific dynamics of a particular institutional domain, like linguistic pluralism or religious pluralism, and these more general concerns that political theorists uh, are, are concerned with. So I would argue both for normative theory and for empirical analysis for that moving back and forth uh, between levels of analysis. Yeah, great. So, I mean, I think to take away from that question is both the kind of um, comment that sh we should speak to each other more across those, those disciplines in some senses, and also um, in our own work to be moving between the two. And I think that really does speak to the kind of uh, complexity of these issues and how best to approach them. Um, and so moving on, I guess, to a, um, another f complex issue, um, to speak about some of what you said about the religious dimensions of political conflict and political violence. Um, and we haven't had your lecture yet, so I'm sure I'm going to hear a lot more about um, your view. But just reading a little bit about what you said about this one thing um, that struck me is that you argue that religious conflict proper is not just different in intensity, but is different in content. Um, and I take this as mainly being because it seeks to change the substantive regulation of public life in a way that other kinds of ethnic or national conflicts do not. So one example you give is um, Sharia law, for example. So I was wondering whether you thought of the idea of a, a war or an intervention to impose a liberal order couldn't also be described in this way. So I think you do acknowledge that secular ide ideolog ideologies can make similar claims, um, but you seem to think this is no longer kind of prominent since the fall of fascism and communism. Um, and that also somehow religious claims are more distinctive. Um, so I can imagine there might be somebody, um, and for today it will be me, um, who might argue that um, the rise of neoliberal kind of Western liberalism um, could be seen to be similar. So some kind of intervention that's trying to impose um, a neoliberal order could also be seen to be substantively changing the regulation of, of public life in a certain way. Um, and that it's just because there's enough consensus on this issue that it, it feels more neutral in some way than, than others. Yes, I think that's entirely correct. That is, I think that um, uh, we should not um, treat... Uh, neoliberalism, or liberalism itself for that matter, paleoliberalism, um, as somehow only a neutral framework within, within which various projects for the pursuit of good life can be um, compete with one another on even terrain. Clearly, liberalism is itself a substantive um, social, moral, political, and legal order. And um, so, so there's a, and, and, and you're absolutely right that there's a kind of false patina of neutrality. Um, uh, so I completely agree with you, I get, but I guess my contrast in, in, in this paper was more limited, right? I was suggesting a difference between um, some forms of religious conflict, because you know, not all conflicts that involve in some ways religious claimants are distinctively religious, right? They may well be assimilated to uh, ethno-political conflict, and the parties to the conflict may be named in religious terms, like for example in Northern Ireland, without the conflict being distinctively about religion, etc. Uh, but some forms of religious conflict have re distinctively religious stakes. They are about how we should live, not just say who gets what. And I guess my argument in the paper was that linguistic conflicts are not like that. They are typically um, not about um, fundamental questions about how we should live. Right? They are about what the language of public life should be, which massively advantages or disadvantages certain groups and so on, but they're not about competing understandings of social order. They are normatively less loaded. They're normatively more thin, um, uh, which is not to say that particular languages aren't felt to be very thick by people, but conflicts over language, I think, are different in principle from many, not all, conflicts over religion. But I, I do agree with you that um, it's not only that it's certainly far from the case that um, religious conflicts are somehow uniquely about the substantive regulation of public life. Okay, great. So my next question is perhaps less um, distinctively about things that, that you work on, 
um, but something that I think is very interesting and very topical at the moment. Um, I think topics of gender inequality and lack of diversity in the academy are really kind of discussed at the moment in many departments and universities and are very important issues. Um, and I was wondering if you thought, um, given that you've been thinking about difference and inequality um, and the different ways inequality is shaped and created, um, if you thought any of, of that work could speak to these, mm. these um, debates that we're having at the moment um, in academia. Uh, well, of course, it's not just in academia, but in, in right. other settings as well. And it's actually, I think it's quite striking, the um, uh, persistence of very high degrees of occupational sex segregation um, uh, even in very, what we like to think of as liberal progressive societies like Sweden, for example, have very high rates of occupational sex segregation. Um, and, 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 and I would say then when you see it in, for example, the academic world, when you see women concentrated into certain fields and men in others, that's an instance of that. So occupational sex segregation in certain fields being predominantly males. Uh, what's really striking is how, how uh, this has persisted until into into late modernity, and it seems highly resistant to various kinds of policy interventions. So, I, obviously, there's some some, um, and the academic is true in the academy as well. There's some fields that used to be um, highly segregated by sex, which no longer are. And so, in the U.S., you know, management now is really very um, uh, management taken as a whole is very integrated. You know, doctors, lawyers, etc., become very even. But there is an astonishing number of fields that remain. 95%, 97% female, 98% male, uh, with no change at all in their sex. So why is this? And what can be done about it? And should something be done about it? So I, I guess the one, one tool that I found, for, which I came, uh, talked about a little bit in this paper on difference and in inequality, but also use in, in my teaching, is, is an attempt to, to think about this, this stunning kind of persistence of occupational sex segregation in a context in the you know, Last, in the last four decades where you have these massive moves of women to the labor market and massive moves towards formal equality. So why does this happen? So the best analysis that I've seen of this tries to distinguish the horizontal aspects of this from the vertical aspects. That is the horizontal aspects driven by some process of, um, um, by, by, by still resonant ideologies of difference. Um, what some sociologists call gender essentialism, widely shared ideas that somehow women are just different than men and they like to do different things and they have different occupational aspirations and different um, uh, educational aspirations and so on, which are, and, and you know, uh, versus the vertical dimension, which, which is about putative superiority. And, that, and I think what sociologists who study this in detail have shown is that the, those, those assumptions about superiority have been massively weakened held by very few people now, but the striking thing about those assumptions about difference is how robust they are and how they're shared by many women themselves who think of themselves, I don't know, you know so I hear this all the time from my students, so I'm a people person, right? I, I don't want to work in this, in, you know, I want to work with people. Uh, and you know, guys will say, whatever, I want to work with my machine. Now, where those come from, I'm not, there's no implication at all that those are you know, somehow grounded in, in fundamental difference, but that they are somehow robust uh, they continue to be reproduced and so on, and that this then um, can lead men and women into different you know, educational investments, et cetera, and, and different occupational tracks and so on, even if, and the, the kind of conceptually interesting thing in my view, is that this can happen even if there were, even if, say, at, in the vertical dimension, all, di all vertical differences uh, were to disappear. Now, they haven't yet, but they, even if they were, you might have this, and that then raises this fundamental question. Can you have can you have difference without inequality, or is that conceptually incoherent? And should we, or sh what should what should a feminist stance, for example, be towards difference um, versus inequality? Can you can you have real inequality if you still have this kind of massive difference, or should feminism really pursue an elimination of difference that is such that ideally men and women would not have different occupational um, aspirations would not have different educational trackings and so on. It's a tough question for feminists themselves, and feminists are not—they're not entirely um, unified on, on this thought. So, I think it's just—it's—it's—it's—it is striking uh, and and good to think with when one when one asks why is it that even in this era of 
you know, all kinds of change in the, in the sex gender order, why is it that we still have this massive degree of concentration of men in certain occupations and women in others? Great, so that's a really, um, yeah, really interesting answer. Um, and I think it does speak to the, um, some of the, the problems that we face, face in academia, the idea that there is kind of an expectation sometimes that, for example, um, it's mainly going to be women wor working on feminism or certain right. kinds of, um, um, of other subjects. And I think what kind of struck me particularly is you speaking about talking about it in the classroom. And I think if, if it is true that um, we have this distinction between the hierarchy and the, the horizontal, which is also, I think, a really interesting way to think about it, um, then maybe the way to tackle the kind of this robust um, view and the reproduction of it is in places like the classroom and in challenging people to really um, kind of think about why they say things like, I'm a people person right. and I, I am, and to really kind of get to the core of these essentializing um, categories. Right. So I think that's something to, to think about how we perhaps discuss these things in the classroom. This might be one way in the long term we can try to reshape academia a little bit um, in that respect. Um, and I think related, um, Related to this, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your forthcoming book because I think um, it touches on perhaps on some of the, these issues as well. Um, so I think you're, it's entitled Trans, Gender and Race in an Age of Unsettled Identities. Um, and I was wondering if, just to end off, you could tell us a little bit about, about that book. Yes. Uh, well, it's no territory for me in part, having never worked on transgender issues at all and only glancingly on, on gender. Um, but on the other hand, it does follow from this interest in categories, and in this book I'm specifically concerned with the ways in which um, both sex and gender on the one hand and race and ethnicity on the other hand uh, are understood as increasingly open to choice and change, yet in very different ways and to very different degrees. And I think we're faced with a, a paradox here in that it is easier and much more socially legitimate and acceptable to change sex or gender uh, than it is to change race. And yet, uh, one might think uh, that the opposite would be the case, since uh, one might argue that uh, divisions between the sexes, hormonal, physiological, morphological, etc., are much more deeply rooted, even if they are, of course, also socially and culturally constructed, nonetheless much more deeply rooted and substantial than differences between socially defined racial categories. So why is that? Um, I mean, this is one theme um, I explore in the book, and I um, argue that um, it is the resources that we have for thinking about sex and gender on the one hand and race and ethnicity on the other hand that make it easier um, to um, choose and change sex and gender, and specifically the distinction between sex and gender, for which there's no analog in the domain of, of race and ethnicity, allows one to divorce gender from the sexed body, to think of gender then as a purely individual, subjective state, knowable only by the individual concerned, uh, uh, and to reverse kind of the conventional causal uh, and normative ordering, that is instead of seeing the sexed body as foundational and gender identity as something that follows natural from that, we can see gender identity as foundational and the sexed body as something that can be chosen and changed to match that underlying gender identity, especially since that gender identity, on the one hand, yes, is disconnected from the sexed body, but it too then is re-naturalized in a very common way of thinking. That is, gender identity is itself seen, using the narrative of born that way, as itself grounded in biology, so that it then becomes um, a very strong position to argue that, uh, okay, if my gender identity is distinct from my outwardly sexed body, uh, uh, that gender identity, because it's understood as unchosen, unchanging, naturalized, etc., it's a very good reason for you and others to uh, change your way of classifying me to accord with what's straight taken as fundamental, that is gender identity, which only I can know and name. Nothing like that in the domain of race or ethnicity. We have no conceptual resources for thinking of racial identity as something purely subjective over which only the individual about which only the individual has true knowledge. Rather, race and ethnicity is seen as a super-individual property. Your ancestry is implicated in your race and ethnicity. The individual is not the only owner and custodian of that identity. Others are involved in it. 
it's implausible to claim that others' classifications are simply a mistake, uh, right? Uh, and ancestry is then implicated in such different ways for sex, gender on the one hand, and race and ethnicity on the other hand, right? So yes, your sex uh, at birth is taken to be inherited, but in this very peculiar way that doesn't involve any lineage or history, right? It's just a stochastic moment. Your sex chromosomally is determined by uh, whether uh, an egg cell is fertilized by a particular uh, sperm cell or another one, right? Uh, so. Uh, Whereas we understand race and ethnicity to be inherited in a very different way, in a way that involves ancestry, more than the individual concerned, um, uh, to be familial, etc. So again, that makes it harder for us to think of race and ethnicity as something that can be chosen and changed. And yet, nonetheless, so, these, so, so that's my answer to the paradox, and yet at the same time, I do think, and this is the reason for treating the two together, more than is usually acknowledged, race and ethnicity are also coming to be understood as choosable and changeable. It's just that we don't have any name for this phenomenon, right? There is, there, there is no transracial as a thing, as a socially recognized, validated, institutionalized thing, analogous to the way transgender has become a socially recognized, validated, acknowledged thing. So instead, we have a variety of ways in which people are choosing and changing racial identities, but they don't come together in, a, in an institutionalized phenomenon. It's more individual. You have people this is very common, say, for mixed race people who choose and change and so on. You have people who pass. You have reverse passing like Rachel Dolezal and others. Uh, you have the performative enactment of racial identities at variance with those that you might seem, seem to be uh, uh, entitled to by virtue of your act. All of this is happening. The category is being massively destabilized, but it works in a very different way from the now quite solidly institutionalized um, forms of transgender experience. So I thought that it would be useful to bring together uh, the ways in which gender has become uh, 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 such an unsettled category in recent decades with the ways in which race has become unsettled. A conversation that, um, that, that, that so I think bringing these two, two unsettled identities together can help each be used to fruitfully illuminate the other. So that's the premise of this new book. Great. Well, um, I think they're both very, very timely and important issues, and it's really um, great to be giving them more attention. Um, and yeah, that's it for the questions I have. Thank you so much for a really interesting conversation. Um, and I My look pleasure. forward to the rest of what we have to come this evening and tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thanks very much.